Shalom, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Sendit Salam. Yes, brothers and sisters. All right, let's let us let us continue with Ikev. Ikev. Now Ikev is the forty-sixth um, Torah portion reading and feeding, and we want to spend a little bit of time um, just touching on the name, just getting into Ikev, because Ikev has a sense and a saying of, of of if or because when we read it in 7 and 12 it says wherefore it shall come to pass if right that idea of wherefore it shall come to pass and be him your honor and be him and like this and be him and like this your honor it will be or it might be if now it's a conditional now there is a conditional here some will tell you that well with God there's no condition you know what I'm saying unconditional it's not so scripture that that sounds nice you know that sounds very nice when you say well with God there's, there's no conditions it's unconditional love according to what I and I read understand the scripture there are some conditions for example there's the the faith condition right there's the faith condition here with Christ according to the word that we read concerning Christ and in, in, in Matthew's gospel there was the condition of hearing the saying and and either if you do it you are likened to a wise man and if you do not do it you are likened to a foolish man Right? And there's consequences. There are definitely certain consequences. And we need to understand this. So, for our obedience, there is a consequence, which is the consequence is a blessing, is a barakat. For our disobedience, there is the curse. Now, we know that we as the once lost but now found they to Israel have been under the negative consequence of the curse, but through our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, we come into the barakat, right? We come into the, the blessing through our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. You know what I'm saying? Before it was the curse, right? This is the curse, but now we come into the blessing. Let us understand it. But there is still more to be done. You understand to fulfill. You understand to fulfill the will. So first we must learn well what is his will. Now this is why Torah study is so very important. And there's also a portion of this particular um this particular uh Torah portion, this teaching the forty sixth Torah portion. And if you go to the Devari or go to the online, right if you check it out online on the wiki page and you come up to this particular portion here's, here's where we're at right now where there's another midrash right we dealt with the first midrash that connected it with um, Psalm 46 49 and 6 where it was translated oh, why should I fear in the days of evil now my brothers and sisters we're in the days of evil you understand we're in these days of evil we have to also understand um, there's, there's um, the fear of the Lord, you understand? And then there's the fear or the phobias of the world. Now, these phobias of the world, we know them as depression, insomnia, you understand? Um, and there's various other um, um, trauma-based mind control. All of that is, is a part of the worldly sicknesses and the diseases. He says ready to hear that he will take away from us all sickness. You know, it's in all sickness. But see, what's the key? The key is the the Amen. The key is the imminent. The key is the faith, the hymenal, the true and living faith. It's like Yeshua, Iesus, Gita Iesus, he says, if one hears the saying Shema, so it's important to hear, right? To hear. So if one hears it and does it, 
Notice that right there. And it's not good enough to say, well, I hear it. Well, one must hear it and do it. And now that's New Testament. But that New Testament is a real substance now of this shadow that we read here in the Old Testament. Now, with the name Ikev, right, another Midrash, it played on two possible meanings of the second word of Deuteronomy 7 and 12, Ikev, as a consequence or the end. Now, it's interesting that literally Ikev is actually the heel. It actually means the heel, like the, you know, like you have your foot and you have the heel. Now that's interesting because it speaks of the original prophecy that we have in Genesis concerning the two seeds, the seed of the serpent, right, and the seed of the woman, where the seed of the serpent, right, shall bruise the man-child's heel. Right, the the ikev, the heel, while the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. Shall bruise the serpent's head. Now that's very very important when we look at this big picture and now we look at this portion right here, this Torah portion. So here another another midrash, right, where Israel had asked now Jah when Jah would grant reward. So Israel wanted to know, like I and I people want to know, well, if we do this, when do we get our reward? And if we keep this, when do we get our reward? Well, what is Jah's reply? What is Jah's answer? Jah's reply is that when people observe the commandments, let's call it the will, right, of Jah, they enjoy some fruits now. Now when we, even when we do the, the the Lord said the joy of the Lord is I and I strength. Even when we observe that joy, you know, which brings a positive mental attitude of faith, which brings a positive confidence, you know, it's an encouragement, you know, there's some fruit. It is fruitful. But Jah will give their full reward, right, the full reward in the end. Now, here it says after death. Now, of course, many people think of that as the pie in the sky move. But no, remember, this is the Old Testament, but we have to take the veil off of it so we see it in Yeshua. If we look at it in Yeshua, that death is the born-again process. Because the old man must what? Die. You know, since that Negro, the black, and the coloredness in us must die. So that the new man, so the true Ethiopian Hebrew, the elect, you know, Rastafari, that inborn conception can be brought forward. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like to say that if one says, well, yeah, I check for Rastafari, but they only check on the outer level, so maybe they eat Aital. There is some benefit to that. You know what I'm saying? Or they listen to reggae music. There's some benefit to that. Or even the anabosom, the herb. There is some benefit, some fruit to that. But the, but, but the fullness is in the fulfillment, you know what I'm saying, of his will. And that means to be born again, to have a metanoia. You know what I'm saying? A, a, a change of mind. You know what I'm saying? Not to be conformed to the world but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because our mind is stayed on thee. Our mind is stayed on him, on his spirit, on his truth, on his word, on his life. And that's what leads us into that transformational process. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't happen overnight, and we have to recognize that it doesn't happen overnight. You know what I'm saying? But we also have to recognize when it begins, and we have to take that conscious decision. We have to make that conscious decision to receive Yeshua HaMushia. You know what I'm saying? Yesus Christos as our Gita, as our Master, as our Medhanitachin, as our Savior. You understand? In order for it to begin. So we have to lay hold as as Yaakov laid hold on Esau's heel. Same word. It's the same word. I can it's the very one and the same word. Now, there was another Midrash, right? And the Midrashes are some of the ancient Hebraic and Judaic teachings. You know, where ones and ones would meditate on this Torah word. You know, and would reason in the 
Havarim, with reason on it, says we should reason on it. You understand in our Bible studies, you understand, or in our Ainai gatherings, you understand, reason, one time as Rastasari, we should reason on the scriptures of the Bible. So these are various different um, um, reasonings or understandings that have been preserved for us so we can study these things and grow in these things. But the interesting thing about this is that, for example, if we look at Psalm, let's go here for a moment, Psalm 49, the Psalm that was quoted in the earlier Midrash. We're going to return to chapter 7, but let's go to 49, 49 and, 49 and 6, it says, um, um, 49, see it says 49 and 6. All right, 49 and, and 6, and 49 and 6. Where is, where is, now we know that the, the Hebrew is sometimes um, um, a little bit different. A little bit different. Let's see, go rich and poor. Okay, it's actually verse 5. It's actually verse 5. There's a different numbering in the Hebrew. So when we read from here to here, sometimes it's different numbering in the song. So Psalm 49, to the chief musician, a song for the sons of uh, Kore or Korah. Hear this, all ye people. Hear this. Right, hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom. Once again, wisdom is coming up. You know what I'm saying? So, some key words in this Torah portion is barakat, is blessing, is wisdom. You know what I'm saying? Is wisdom, is obedience, right? Um, is fulfilling or doing my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation the meditation of I and I heart of our consciousness shall be of overstanding not just to get an understanding but an overstanding it says I will incline my ear to a parable I will listen to a parable incline my ear my inner ear I will open my dark saying upon the heart you know what I'm saying? Upon the harp, because in the music, even when we listen to some of the old roots music, it's mystical, it has dark sayings, but things that you have to understand with that wisdom and in inclining your ear to that parable. Verse 5, it says, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil? These, brothers and sisters, this, is, this is also compares with Ephesians chapter 6. You understand? To do all to stand, to stand in this evil day. He says, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity or the rebelliousness of my heels, of my footsteps, my heels, right, shall compass me about? Then it goes on to say that they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, don't we live in these times? Well, we see many ones who trust in their wealth, and they boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God, nor give to God a ransom for him. So no matter how much money you have, you can't give to John, uh, 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 like the ransom money, and redeem your brother or sister. You understand? For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Don't we see that happen in this world? Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. You know, like all these European monarchies and these secret society folks and New World Order globalists, Illuminati, the inward thought is that their houses, you know, and their states shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations, forever and ever and ever. And they call their lands, notice that they call their lands 
after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. This their way is their folly. So see, the, this their way, the way that they walk, is their, is their folly. Right? It's not the way, the truth, and the life of our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it is their way, right? Yet their posterity approve their sayings, say la. Yet their children and those who come after approve of what their foolish ancestors have said. But it says, like sheep, they are laid in the grave, like sheep, ba, ba. This is a sheeple. We live in the time of the sheeple. Right, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death feedeth on feed on them, and the upright shall have get this dominion. That's I and I. The upright, the straightforward, shall have dominion over them in the morning, in the dawning, even of this new age. Right, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God, Jah will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall Kabbalah I Makebel. He shall receive I and I and I. Selah. Be not thou afraid, my brothers and sisters, but especially the brothers. Don't be afraid. You understand? Don't be afraid, right? When one is made rich. You know, in this world, when one has a lot of dollars, don't be, don't be afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. You know, saying, oh, he got enough money, right? For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. All the honors and pomps and pride, it's not going to go with him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. He blessed his own soul. John didn't bless him. You know, where did he get that from? He was blessing his own soul because he got money. Right? He blessed his, his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. So, because people are praising you, you really got to check out what you're doing. Because people will praise you when you're doing well for yourself. Isn't that what everybody's talking about? I got to do well for myself. This is their way. This is their folly. You understand? Know it's just like what we're reading in this Torah portion where it says about um, going after strange gods and remembering that this is I and I wisdom. You understand? Know this is I and I way. But there's another way. There's another astray way. Now what Dawi or David or the sons of Korah are saying right here is that why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of the rebellion of my heels can pass me about? And then he immediately goes to those who trust in their wealth. They don't trust in John. They don't have faith in John. They have faith in their wealth. And I pray that I and I peoples in this day, in this time, will not be like that and would hear the good news and the call of the king and learn the teaching of his majesty. You know, because it's, it, it, we're in this world where folks trust in their wealth, they boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. Notice what they trust. They trust how much wealth they have. You know, like if I and I had, I had, had enough money, then ones would trust I and I more in the worldly sense. But that is folly. That is that is what we call a fuckery. That's that's folly. You know, so that's idiocy, spiritually speaking. Because it says, though while he lived, he blessed his soul. So that man, that type of man, while they live, they bless themselves. Because they know they don't got no blessing with John Rastafari. So they got to bless themselves. And it says that men, people, men and people will praise you when you do as well to thyself. You know what I'm saying? When you're, when you're this, 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 this embodiment of the God of this world, of Satan, of Diablos, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not you know what I'm saying? So one in a, in a high estate, but they don't understand these spiritual truths, these real truths, the real teaching of His Majesty. They are like the beast, right? They are like the what? The beast that perish. 
So we talk about beast. But it's saying that the man who's in honor and doesn't have any understanding of truth, which is to say the teaching of his majesty in spirit and in truth, whether they know it's a teaching or not, but when they don't understand, because says my people perish because of a lack of what? My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Check this one out right here. Check this one out right here. It says, and this is Isaiah chapter 8, that part where it says about um, they shall never see light. They shall never see light in verse uh, 18 of Psalm 49. Compare that with Isaiah. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 where it says to the law and to the testimony. To the law which is Torah, and to the testimony, which is the testimony of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. What does it say? It says, if they speak not according to this word, if they don't speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So they call themselves Illuminati. I and I are the true Illuminati. They're not the true Illuminati. We are the ones who are the light of Yeshua HaMoshiach in the face of his majesty, in the face of Kedamawi Haile Shalasi, in the face of Jaras the Farai. We have that light, that true illumination, the word of God, but he is the true light. He was in the light which lighteth every man that come into the world. Let's follow this light point straight through to the New Testament. We're speaking about illumination. You understand? This is the illumination. The true light is Jesus Christ, is Yeshua HaMoshiach. You're saying he is the true Illuminati, and we are the true illuminated ones who have that light. Let's go through this light for a moment, and to see right here, it says that all things, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the what? And the life right, was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to be a witness of the light, that all men might, or that all men through him might, my men, might trust, might admit, or in King James it says, believe. He was not that light, so John wasn't the light, but was sent to be a witness, to testify of that light. Now Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos, is the true light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world, what, knew him not. So my brothers and sisters, you have to recognize in the King of Kings, and through his Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, that we are the light of this world. You understand? As he is, you understand, so are we in this world. And that is Wengel. That is gospel. That is good news. But see, in order to, you have to, you have to receive it. You understand? You have to admit in it. You have to, um, you have to accept that truth. If you deny it, or if you are uh, wiggle, 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 you know, wishy washy about it, you'll think like it says the, the unstable, you know, don't pray and, and doubt. Because the unstable man, the double minded man, is unstable in all his ways. Because the double mindedness, the bipolarness, is also a sickness. You know what I'm saying? It's also a sickness. So, how he takes away the, that disease is dependent, right, on our faith. You understand? On our faith and doing according to his will. This is why the Al Kidan is so important. Now, we're still here on Ikev, right? Ikev. Now, Ikev, there's another Midrash that plays on two other possible meanings of the second word of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 12. Ikev. Ikev. As a consequence and heal. Just as we've been saying, heal. The Midrash interpreted the words upon Adam, Adam, which is another name of Esau or Esau, 
I cast my shoe in Psalm 60 and 10 and 108 and 10. What does that mean? Well, that means that Jah, or God, if you please, says that when Israel, when we as black Israel, when we as Ethiopian Hebrews, when we as elect Rastafari, when we repent, then Jah will treat yet yeah, or excuse me, will tread rather he will tread with God's heel. Jah will tread with his own divine heel, so to speak, on Israel's enemy, on Edom, on Esau, and all the other haters of Black Beta Israel, all of the haters of Jah's people. Right? And the Midrash had taught this furthermore in the words of Deuteronomy 7 and 12 that, quote, it shall come to pass in Dehem Yehonah. It shall come to pass because I have you hearken. This will happen because we Shema. This will happen. So even hearing this message and these messages is a barakat, is a blessing. Right, and I and I pray for one's um, understanding, understanding, and growth in this word. Right now, there was Rabbi uh, Samuel Bar Nahmani, and he interpreted the words that quote that the Lord your God shall keep you in Deuteronomy seven and twelve. Same verse. We're still in that one verse, right? He interpreted the words that the Lord your God shall keep you in Deuteronomy 7.12 teaching that all the good that Israel enjoys in the world results from the blessing, the barakat with which Balaam or Balaam blessed Israel. So this one Rebbe, he interpreted that the blessing that Israel that we've had in the world previously right, is from Balaam's blessing. This is interesting. But the barakat with which the patriarchs, our fathers, our forefathers, bless Israel, we Ethiopian Hebrews, are reserved for the time to come. You understand? And we're coming in that time to come in this present time. And we need to prepare, pray, and prepare, right? That the Lord your God shall keep for you. So when you read carefully the words, shall keep for you, he shall keep this up in store for us. So our barakat, we haven't lost our blessings, people. You understand? Even for all the name, all the years that we did not know our name, you understand, and that we were lost sheeple, we did not lose that blessing of the patriarchs because Jah has kept that, you understand, for us even for this time of the end. So Rebbe Bibi ben uh, Gidal, he said that Simeon the Just taught that the law, right, or Torah, it prohibited a Jew, uh, a, a Yehudi, a Hebrew, an Ihud, from robbing a non-Jew, although a Jew could take possession of a non-Jew's lost article. So we're forbidden to rob one who is not an Ethiopian Hebrew, you know what I'm saying, or a Rastafari, right? But that the Ethiopian Hebrew, the Yehudi, or the true elect Rastafari, can take possession of a non-Hebrew, or a non-Rastafari's lost article. Now, Rav Huna, he had read in Deuteronomy 7 and 16 to prohibit a Jew from robbing a non-Jew because 716 of Deuteronomy, it provided that the Beta Israel or the Israelian were to take from the enemies that God would deliver to them in time of war. So when one's raised war against us, this now implies that the Israelite could not take from a non Jew, a non Hebrew in time of peace, in time of shalom, right? That when Jah had not delivered them into the Israelites' hand. But if Jah has delivered them into Ainai's hand, then all that they have 
are ours, according to the Kal Kidan. Very important for us to um, understand that right there. Now, um, this part right here, it, it goes on, right, to deal with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace. We're going to pause on this for a moment because we're not quite done with this this particular chapter. We're going to get into the next part of IKF, right, of IKF. So these are some of the possible, you understand, um, meanings, you understand, as we look into this. So you can see it's rich, you understand, it's rich in that context, even just this one word, which is the name of this Torah portion. You understand, whether we look at it as meaning is, because, the consequence of, or even in its literal sense, heal in the connotation or in the context of, of footsteps. You understand? Recalling Yaakov, Jacob, and Jacob's name. And also recalling, I think it's Genesis uh, 3, right? Genesis 3 and um, 3 and 15. Let's go to Genesis 3 and 15 for a moment. If you go to Genesis 3 and... Um, 15, it says, and I will put enmity, which is hatred, right? Hatred or hard feelings, enmity between thee and the woman. Now, I was speaking to the serpent, you understand, or Satan, Diablos, or the enemies, the haters of Beta Israel, of I and I, covenant people. And between thy seed and her seed, we are of the her seed. And it shows, it says, bruise thy head saying that the seed of the, 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 the woman, right, the seed of the woman, you understand, or the black Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, shall bruise, right, shall bruise the head, right, of the seed of the serpent. But the seed of the serpent shall bruise, right, the seed of the serpent shall bruise the heel or the eye calf, the eye calf. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is very, very interesting because even as we're going through, we didn't really plan to touch on this part right here. But even as we go through, we have this picture that one of the prisoners had actually sent, you know, had gifted I and I. Um, and, and we give thanks and we pray for the brothers, you know what I'm saying, and even the sisters too. But you see the feet? See, see, the feet are very important in this particular portion. Because remember, the feet walk the what? They walk the way. Or it's the feet that goes astray. Remember how Christos, Yeshua, how he, how he anointed, how he washed. His feet were anointed by the woman, but how he washed the disciples' feet. Even though he was master of all, he washed the disciples' feet. So, so when we look at the feet, you know what I'm saying, um, see, in the West, we might not be able to get it immediately, you know what I'm saying, in the West. Because we're looking in the Torah, we have to remember that it's not a Western Gentile sense, but we have to look to the East. You know what I'm saying, when we say look to the East, to look to the proper context, you know what I'm saying, of these words and how they are used, because they brought it and give more clarity you know, into the biblical and the spiritual meaning and the both the interpretation but also especially the application. So um, let us continue and move forward and just kind of summarize um, this portion right here on IKF, right? So IKF, what do we have right here? IKF, right? If we look at IKF, right? IKF. I I can or or we can say I can right I can right literally it means heal right literally it means heal right heal now let's also remember that this is also part of the root of the name Jacob so we have we have Jacob here right we have Jacob and now remember speaking about the God, right? Who is speaking here? It's the God of Jacob, right? It's the El, it's the Chaya, the power of Jacob, the mighty God, right, that is speaking now 
to the children, the Beta Israel, the Dagika Israel, the Bani Yisrael. So it's the heel, but now the context in this particular sentence right here has a context of if, right? If, right? Um, because, right? Because, right? It has the context of of if it, it, it shall come to pass, if, because, heal, you understand? Also consequence, right? We have consequence as a matter of consequence, you understand? If you hear, you understand? If you hearken, if you shema, the old sense, if you shema. Let's go to um, this verse once again, and, and this, now with this better clarification, let's read this verse. Now, if you have the Schofield Study Bible, just take a look at the subscription. It says, the promise, right, the promise of victory if you do this. The promise of victory because you hear. The promise of victory as a consequence. But then it comes to that heal. Now, remember that heal we have in Genesis, the very first kind of mention of heal we have in Genesis. So I, I want you to keep in mind with this particular, both Jacob, see how Jacob is connected to this, I is connected to Jacob and the God of Jacob, you know, as well as the heel. Now Jacob is known as the heel grabber, you know, what I'm saying? or the one who heals, you know, what I'm saying? not heals as as healing of sickness so much, but the one who seizes the heel. So we have two seeds here. Now I read to you on the two foundations, right? The two foundations from Mateo's Wengel, where it said that the wise man is the one who hears the sayings and does them. And the only difference between the wise and the foolish, they both hear it. But one does it. They, they, they hear the word and they do it. And the foolish, you know, then hears it and does not do it. So you see the two consequences. You know, then the if, the because of, for, for, for having faith and exercising and acting on it. So what's implied here is an action. You know, then what's implied here is an obedience. You understand? Know, What's implied here, also we can say, is a knowledge. And then we also have wisdom that's in this. Remember, the Torah, the Ori, this is your wisdom. Now remember, Jacob, right, is, is, is the, is the, well, we can say the birth name, but he has a new name, right, as Israel. If you notice in the scriptures, whenever Yah, Jah, if you please, refers to um, the people as Jacob. It's in a different, there's a different um, application than when he refers to the people as Israel. And in this prophetic time, 2012, it speaks of um, Jacob's troubles, right? Jacob's troubles. Now, we touched on Psalm 49, and said, why you know, wherefore will I see in the days of evil, you understand, when the iniquity of my own heel, right, my own walk, you understand, come passing me about. When that iniquity of my own walking astray, but my own consequences. So now the washing of the feet, you see, the, the, the washing of the feet has a great significance. Some would look at it and say, oh, well, that was a tradition in the East. Well, yes, it was a tradition, but there's a greater significance. There's even a metaphysical significance for so the brothers and sisters who are able to. In fact, I think we have it right here. Let's just deal with the feet. You know what I'm saying? Let's just deal with the feet right here. When we looked into the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, we actually came across feet. As it defines many different names, you know what I'm saying? It also defines certain other attributes as well, too. So we came across this right here in feet. Feet. It says that phase of our understanding. The feet represent that phase of our 
understanding or overstanding, if you please, which comes into contact with substance. What do we call the Old Testament is the shadow. The New Testament is the substance. Right? The Old Testament is the new concealed. The new is the old revealed. Right? So now the feet represent a phase of our comprehension, of our understanding, which comes into direct contact with substance. Consequently, we can take possession of all substance that we comprehend and understand. Did you get that? We can take possession of all substance that we what comprehend and understand or overstand. We can take possession of it. Now I want you to recognize what we're speaking about. You understand? When we're speaking about the land. You understand? That's the next portion of this Torah portion reading and feeding is on taking the land. But now this portion 46 here, it, it now sets this up. This is why the name is so important. You all tend to recognize these, these key words, these key elements. You all with, um, consequently, we can take possession of all substance. That's why it says to um, even Joshua. Remember, now Joshua is the new leader that's coming up, right? In fact, he's in a sense, he is likened to Moses. But we'll get into that aspect right there. Because as we go forward, um, in the name of the I am, when it's in the name of Yah, it's in the name of Jah, it's in the name of Yeshua, you say it's in the name of Yahweh, of, of, of God, right? Say the I am, the Ehya, Asha, Ehya, the Ehya, Asha, Ehya. This is the meaning of Joshua, Iyasu 1 and 3, quote, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon to you have I given it as I spake to Mashu or to Musa, to Moshe. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. So let's put this up here. We'll actually put this right here. Joshua by 1 and three. Now, why is that important? Because to Joshua, he says this, right? Make sure you remember, write down this principle. We can take possession, write down, I can take possession of all substance that I comprehend and understand in the name of the I am, in the name of Jah, right? And now Joshua 1 and 3 says, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon. Rastafari was a trod. You understand? Know Aina is trodden. Aina is what Rastafari? We are trodding Rastafari. You get that connection? We are trodden. It's connected with the Ikev. You understand? It's connected with the heel, the Ikko, the Ikev. And it's connected with this prophetic word in Joshua 1 and 3 which says to us that every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, shall trod upon, shall yard upon, to you, to you have I given it as I spake to Moses. So that's his witness. That's Yahweh's witness there is Mashu or Moses. Now the feet are the most willing and patient servants of the body, the feet. They go all day at the bidding of the mind. So your feet goes wherever your mind bids. If you say, oh, I'm going to go over there. Oh, no, what's that over there? Your feet just goes along. They're willing. You know what I'm saying? They're patient. You know what I'm saying? They go at the bidding of the mind all day, every day. And upon them rest. Upon the feet now rest what? The burden of the thought. The burden of the thought of materiality. The more we believe or the more we trust or the more we admit in matter, in matter, speaking about substance, material matter, right? The more we admit in matter, the greater, the greater the burden laid upon the feet. The more we admit in matter, the greater the burden 
that is laid upon the feet, and the more tired, the more tired they become. The denial of materiality, the denial of materiality is illustrated in the washing of the disciples' feet by Yeshua, by Iesus, in John chapter 13, verses 5 to 10. So take that down. John chapter 13, verses 5 to verse 10. Even Petros, Peter, Peter represents spiritual faith. That's what Peter represents, spiritual faith. Even Peter must be cleansed from his belief, his, his belief system, his, his, his admittance and trust in the reality of material conditions. You understand? Many of us, we, we still trust in the material conditions, and we, like Peter, we have spiritual faith, but we must be cleansed from that belief, which is a false trust, in the reality of material conditions. To wash the feet, it seems to be a menial thing, a menial thing, a small thing, a small matter. But in this humble way, right, this is a humble way, Jesus, Yeshua, he taught and exemplified the willingness of divine love to serve by washing the feet. That's why he makes that as something that we should do. You understand? That man may be redeemed from what? What is man redeemed from from washing his brother or sister's feet? He's redeemed from the pride of the flesh. See, there's the pride of the flesh, the pride of the carnal. Now, now recall too, um, Second Corinthians chapter ten that we touched on in this particular Shabbatical. This this, this send batawi um, sivkat, right? So man must be redeemed from the pride of the flesh. That's like mortifying that old man. You understand? So that the new men can come about, and when the new men come about, then can come about the phi nominant or the phi numinant, right? There has been contention among the disciples. There had been contention among the disciples. Like right now, I mentioned this before, I didn't go into much details as of yet, but there's contention even among I and I, there's contention even among I and I brothers and sisters. Sometime over just pride, pride issue. Brothers and sisters might not be reasoning for each other over some minor, small issue or over some material, financial sort of issue, you understand, because there is still that belief in the false reality of so-called material conditions, you understand, so we're allowing the material to stop our spiritual growth, you know, right, but we must be redeemed from that pride of the carnal, that pride of the flesh. There had been contention among the disciples as to who should sit at the master's right and who at his left in the kingdom, in the mengist. You understand? Now, Jesus, Geta Jesus, Adonai Yeshua, was putting an end to this strife. So when Christ washed disciples' feet, it was to put an end to the strife. You understand? By bringing home to his followers the truth that he who willingly performs the lowly, the humble service for others with no thought for personal distinction, with no thought for personal commendation, is the greatest, is the greatest in Jah's kingdom, is the greatest in Jah's kingdom. Now, Yeshua, Jesus, what does he signify? Jesus Christos, Yeshua HaMoshiach, what does Jesus signify. Well, Jesus signifies the I am. So what does the feet represent? Well, the feet represent the phase of the understanding, right, which connects one to the outer or to the manifest world and reveals the right relationship toward worldly conditions in general. The feet. 
You know what I'm saying? How significant is this, my brothers and sisters? And without studying it, we would just have a superficial idea of this. But as we study it, we can see that even in the key words, that, you know, I often say that the Bible, the Metzav Kedus, truly is a glorious book and it's not, you know, people say it's a book like any other book, but no, it's not. And you always say, no, it is not. Because you start to see when you study it, you find these things here and you say, how would a regular, you know that, you know, you know that it can't be flesh and blood. It must be spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that moved Yosin and inspired holy men to write down these holy words. You understand? Because they are set apart from anything, you know, unlike any other book I've studied. And I've studied a lot of different books. And I'm still um, 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 amazed and, and, and awed, you know, by what I still continue to find even in these scriptures, even in these sabbatical portions. You understand? Even though we may have gone over them before and before and before, still you find something there that's the right word, the right message, hopefully for the I and the I and the I and the I and all of I and I and I. Now the washing of the disciples' feet by Yesus, Gitai Yesus, therefore, it typifies a cleansing process. So we're speaking of right here is a cleansing process. Or a denial of personality and materiality. You understand? So there's a cleansing process as well as there must be a denial of personality. Right? A denial of materiality. All right? This is, this is the great or one of the great lessons that we find just by studying the name I can, just by studying this, um, this, this, this first, second word, but the first distinctive word in this particular Torah portion. Now, the next portion that comes up, actually, as we move forward from 17, where it says, If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I. Let's read on. If thou shalt say in your heart, in our consciousness and within, our inner man, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Question. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shall well remember what the Lord thy God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. But see, this time, according to Jeremiah chapter 23, it's no longer from Egypt, but it's from the north country. Is from this North America and from all the countries which Beta Israel have been scattered, which we Ethiopian Hebrews have been scattered. So put that down. Jeremiah chapter 23. It speaks about the new Seder, you understand, of, of the Beta Israel in this time, right? So it says to us that the great temptations which thine eyes saw, the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretch out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do to all the people of whom thou art afraid. So he said, even those who you're afraid of, I got that, just as he got that. You know what I'm saying? Thou shalt not be affrighted at them. We should not be afraid at them. We should not be afraid of them. You know, then whatever they, they tell us, there's giants in, in Ethiopia, or Africa. So what? You know, what I'm saying we'll eat them like bread. You know, then we should not be afraid of them. Thou should not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God, you know, then for the King of Kings, our Father, is among I and I, a mighty job and terrible, right? A mighty job and terrible. I just have to just look this up for myself right here and just see if it's what I just see if it's what I think you know if it's what I think it says in um in verse uh, twenty in verse uh, twenty one right here and see but the Yemiasara Amlak. Yeah Amlak Yavihir Talak and Ah Yemiasara Amlak the Mekakali no winna. You understand? He is amongst us, Kanar Suyatanesha. 
at uh, the ne then the get at then the get you understand so we are not to be and see that fear right there is not just um like fear in the sense of reverence that fear right there is is like a mental shock you understand these things should not wow get you so, so frightened until you you know you you have a real almost like this that's the kind of fear that leads to depression that's the fear that leads to um all these mental sicknesses. He said he'll take that away from I and I when we come in to that Al Kidan and we have true and faithful witness in the Son of Jah, in Yeshua, in Jah and in Joshua. And it says, And the Lord thy God will put out, he'll put out those nations before thee. He'll put them out. They think they're hot now, they'll get put out. You know saying? Put them out. You understand before thee by little and little. You understand know little by little. So if we're able to really see spiritually what's going on in Africa, you understand? Know if we really see spiritually what's going on here in America, if we can see what's going on in the world, the Nibiru, the Planet X, twenty twelve. We should recognize that these are some the great temptations. Our eyes are seeing the signs, the wonders, the the mighty hand, the stretched out arm. Brothers and sisters, it's all there. You understand? What we need to do is carpe diem. We need to seize the day, seize the opportunity, seize the co co the, the, the covenant, seize the heel. Like you know, the, like Yaiko, the heel grabber, Jacob. This, this this time of Jacob's trouble. You understand? If because by consequence, if he hearken, if we hearken. If we seize the opportunity, brothers and sisters, all right, none of those things are impossible to us. It says, thou mayest not consume them at once. We can't do it all at once. Why? Lest the beast of the field increase upon thee, but the Lord thy God shall deliver them to thee. They will be delivered to us, special delivery, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. Now we also have to understand this in this New Testament application. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm reading this as Old Testament. Some might think isn't that old? There's a New Testament application that's even more wonderful even in the Old Testament application. Verse 24, it says, And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand. Their kings and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou hast destroyed them. Then it says, uh, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. You know what I'm saying? Don't tell me, oh, that's African, whatever. Listen, if that's not of Beta, it's Arayel. You better take that elsewhere. We burn it. You know what I'm saying? Thou should not desire the silver or gold that is on them. You know what I'm saying? So, so you recognize ones have to be in this covenant. Otherwise, they're going to say, oh, well, that gold there and silver there, you know, we can take that because that's worth something. John says, we're not to even desire that, nor take it to thee. Not, so not even to take it to ourselves, lest least thou be sneered therein. So here again is another sneer. One is having pity on them and going after their God. Sneer. Here is is looking at the silver or the gold that's on their idols and taking it to ourselves is another sneer. For it is an abomination. It's an abomination to the King of Kings, our Father, to the Lord, our God. It says, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. That's interesting. If we bring all of these so-called, and I know this is going to be harsh for some folks, but it's, it's the truth of the covenant. You understand, and let every man be a liar, but John Rastafari is true. Even a lot of their so-called African idols, these African idols, we're not, we're not in covenant. Remember, this is talking about entering into that land. 
So some people may still have some of these things here, but it says that we're not to bring those things inside in our house. Because if we do, we become cursed just like the thing is cursed. You know what I'm saying? So we bring that into our... This is, you know, and we can go deeper than this and even show how how they, there's even evidence. If one can't receive this spiritually, we can even break it down on even a, a more basic level. You know what I'm saying? But it says that we will be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it. You know what I'm saying? For Jah's sake, detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it. We shall be hate their, their false god, their pagan idols, whether it has silver or whether it has gold. For it is a cursed, right? It is a cursed thing to us because we are in this holy al kidan. We're in a holy relationship. You understand? We are like in a marriage. It's like the marriage of the land. We're in a, you know, we're in a relationship. And we need to really understand that aspect right there. I found something interesting that goes along with this, right? Because it goes on and it says that you should not bring an abomination to your house lest you be a cursed thing like it. That whatsoever one might bring into being out of an idolatrous an idolatrous thing would have the same cursed status. You understand we have the same cursed status. So we can't retrograde or retrofit or reverse engineer their cursed idols. They they cursed us. They 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 detest it. They're abominable to us. All right. Now it was noted that the word abomination is common in both Deuteronomy seven and twenty six and Proverbs sixteen and five. And it was deduced that people now get this overstanding of it from the from the Rabin, the Rambam then. They said that they deduced that the people who are haughty of spirit are as though they worshipped idols. Those people who are haughty, all puffed up in their spirit, is like they worship idols. It's, it's like they're idol worshippers. You understand that right there? It's like they worshipped idols. Right? It's just like they had worshipped idols. Very, very... You know, very, very, um, very, very interesting. All right, very, very, very interesting right there. All right, my brothers and sisters, um, going to take a little pause right here. We only got through portion of uh, chapter seven. Still have chapter eight, chapter nine, ten, and um, I think a portion of eleven right here to read and to study as well. Brothers and sisters, hopefully, if you watch these vids, try to go through the rest of the, the Torah portion reading just to get an idea. You know what I'm saying? Just to get a, a basic idea. Um, you might not understand everything one is reading, you know what I'm saying? But just glean, glean. You might find something here or there and take notes of these things, my brothers and sisters, especially the disciples. Um, and y'all willing, we hope to um, um, be with you shortly and to present another another portion of this Torah portion reading and seeding. So once again, may the peace of the King of Kings, I and I Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, be with one and all. And may you be blessed in the name of Kelamawi Haila Shalom Rastafari Sendat Salam.